Okay, well, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for Nestan for inviting me. Thank you for the frontline club and the photos, TBC for the festival. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I was asked to do a masterclass, which means, which means uh, I suppose, uh, it's a class. I don't know what, what exactly a masterclass is, but what I, I felt would be interesting would be for you, uh, for me to uh, give you my insights on what, to me, um, documentary photography has become. Um, obviously, I want to do that through my eyes and through my experience. And I'm a documentary photographer myself. My work has evolved over time um, and has changed a lot. So as part of this evolution, I've lived myself. Um, and, and part of this evolution in documentary photography, I um, I also witnessed in, in, in the last few years. Um, so I'm going to make this in two parts. The first part is uh, the work I want to show you, uh, which to me is a good example of what documentary photography has become. Um, taking it from the starting point for me, which is the reason why I became a photographer, uh, 10 years ago, because before that I was working in finance. And 10 years ago I became a photographer. And um, I started to become a photographer because of other photographers. That's how it all starts. You want to become a photographer because you like the work of this or that photographer. So, I'm a very classical photographer in black and white. I love black and white. I do. Um, analog prints myself, etc. Like the kind of becoming the old generation of photographers compared to you guys, who obviously are much longer and much more modern than I am. Um, obviously, I do digital photography, but my first uh, first thing for me was to do. Is everyone okay? There? You want you want to you can come in yeah, a а ты же надо Акари тебя делать. Зачем ты читаешь это было отдыхал? Okay, so this masterclass is called Documentary Photography 2.0, which means a new era or a new age or a new type of documentary photography. Um, but before talking about new documentary photography, I'm going to talk to you about the old documentary photography. Well, at least the one that I like, as I was telling you before, these are the people, these are the pictures. Um, that are responsible for me becoming a photographer. So, um, back then, obviously, this, I don't know if you know, if you're familiar with the work of Henri Cartier-Bresson, mm -hmm. and, okay, it's just classical, um, it's about catching the right moment, it's about um, um, making the perfect composition, um, and traveling throughout the world, or even in France because it's French, obviously. And trying to make the best picture and to be a witness of whatever was going on in the world before his eyes. 
and he was working as um, like a painter or like a drawer. So everything had to be balanced, everything had to be at the right place at the right moment, and he was about to catch the right moment. So this is a good illustration of what I think um, he was trying to do. Is he would stand here, he would obviously see the reflection of the, the building in the water, and this graphic round uh, lines in the back, in the, in, the, in the forefront, and then he would wait for someone to basically walk and jump over the water to have the perfect uh, image. And this is one of the images I, I got to know like 20 years ago when I started to look into photography. And this is the kind of pictures that uh, I've been trying to make ever since. Like, I want to make the same picture. I want to catch the right moments. I want to make the perfect composition. And then I want to make it in black and white. And then uh, I, make, uh, I make a good print out of it. So, this is another picture from him. This is a, obviously these are more about people and, and, and um, everyday life, but you can see the composition and the way the, the arms and the, and the hands are flowing. And this is the same idea of catching the right moment. Um, another photographer that I loved that I used to really, really look, look into uh, is um, Joseph Belka. Um, this is one of my favorite. Um, images from him and here it's not so much about comp obviously about composition a lot it's not so much about catching the right moment but it's about the emotion that comes out of the image which is like the second thing that i got interested in photography was was the emotion that was coming out of the picture so here it's the same it's about composition but it's also about the, the emotion that really stands out and i think it's uh, yeah, one of the reasons also I wanted to become a documentary, documentary photography. I'm showing you this work because I'm not showing you any work from photojournalists. I'm not showing you war photography or anything like that. Even though um, I will show you my own work after uh, the first part of this masterclass. Uh, even though I've been into war zones and I'm interested in post-war situations. But I'm showing you these pictures because these are, again, the pictures that I wanted to do, and these are the moments I want to capture. Not so much about being a journalist, but more about becoming an artist. And I think this is a very important point for you guys if you're getting into photography, is whether you want to be a journalist or whether you want to be an artist. I'm telling you this because for me, it has become a problem at some point that I was, I was actually a photojournalist, or I was getting closer and closer to being a photojournalist, but I, I wanted badly to be an artist also. So I, at some point, I had to choose. And I'm showing, again, I'm showing you these old pictures because it brings me back to why I want to become a photographer in the first place. Is I think because I want to become an artist. And I think these images are images by true artists. So this is Joseph Belka as well. Now, I told you about catching the right moments, about composition, about um, catching the emotion as well. I think Kudelka, and this is one of his pictures from the Exile book, this is for me one of the key images as well. It's like if you, your life as a amateur photographer was um, had a rhythm, was meeting a different, um, different pictures that would bring you to the next step. And I think this image is very important because this is one of the very few images where the photographer is not shooting the outside world. Could be the gypsies, if you know this word, could be whatever situation this is looking at when in, in this book exiles. He's shooting at himself. He's shooting his own feet. So suddenly, you realize that uh, as a documentary photographer, you can also take your own picture. You can take your own picture of yourself, basically. So it's another level to me. Now, that kind of is, as I, I'm always uh, a big admirer of, of his work because he was a master. He is a master of a traditional 
uh, 24 by 36 millimeter cam uh, images, black and white, you know, gypsies, exiles, these are all classics. But then at some point he decided to break this and get into something totally different and totally new to him. And it, I think he made he did it very um, successfully. He was as good as a like a photographer, documentary photographer on gypsies, for example, like photographing um, the life of gypsies or or his travel. It was as good as doing that as making these panoramic images of no one basically, it was just city landscapes or whatever, modern landscapes, chaos. Um, and um, and I thought it was pretty courageous to do that. Because once you're good at something, why would you why would you risk why do you risk it? Why would you do something different? Well, I could list a few photographers that I like but that have been doing the same work again and again and again and again over, whatever, 40 or 50 years. Uh, they're being asked to photograph in one city, then in another city, then to do another book, then another book, or... And they, they keep doing the same pictures to me. I don't see the point. I don't see why they still feel they have to do that. Maybe it's for money. Or maybe it's just because they, they just like to do it again and again and again. But to me, photography is about experimenting. Again, because I'm looking more from an artist's view. It's about experimenting, trying new things, and trying to move ahead. Trying to bring it to the next level. And in the meantime, while during the life of one photographer, one artist, you're trying to do that, the whole market or the whole industry is moving even faster. It, and what, what I'm telling you is that um, over the past uh, 10 years, when I was starting to do a lot of black and white traditional photography, etc., um, I've seen things evolving and I've seen new tools, uh, new distribution, new ways to show the, um, your, the pictures. Initially it was mainly in the exhibition. It was all about being exhibited. Um, then it became um, to do a book with a, a book publisher. And, and suddenly in the past few years, everything has just exploded. I'm, not, I, I'm sitting here and I, I, and I can't tell you what is going to be photography in the next few years? I just don't know. I'm not sure exhibition is the right way to show it, uh, photography now. I'm not sure the book form is still a good, a, good, a good way. I don't know if the internet is the right way. I don't know if we should be doing analog photography. I don't know if we should be doing uh, digital photography. These are questions that I'm asking myself. What should I do? Should I take my digital camera? Should I do my analog? Should I take my analog camera? Should I do an exhibition? Should I do a book? Uh, these days there are a lot of self-published books. So you don't even need a publisher. You just do your book yourself at home. You print it yourself and then you sell a few hundred copies. And because of the internet, things are going so fast. You can make a good self-promotion um, of your work and the book can be sold out within a few days while I'm still, I'm still sitting on books that I've gone with publishers that I've, I haven't been sold out for the past whatever X years just because they don't get the same promotion. Um, also, why would we do an exhibition on the walls if you can show your work on the internet and you can show it to millions of people at once? Um, why would you do prints if you do digital photography? I mean, to me, a print is about analog photography. It's about making a print, handmade print. If it's just to have your picture on the screen and to press print, put it, up, put it on the wall, why, why would we need an exhibition? So these questions is all about what to me has become documentary photography. And before I get... So I'm going to show you a few examples of what to me are very good examples of 
very interesting work to me and very inspiring work um, of documentary photography. Uh, but before getting to that, I'm going to show you one work from Mo Dario Moyama, which is from 1972. This is uh, one of his famous books, as you can, see, you can read it. <laughs> it says, Leila Moyana, bye-bye, photography. So, this is not, uh, this is not, uh, this is not, uh, this is a good example, because already in 1972, Moyana was saying, bye-bye, photography. So, and then, basically, this could be a question, Mark, is, What's happening to photography today? Are we saying goodbye to photography? Or is it a new era in photography? And new things are happening. But already 1972, Moyama was able to go really far um, into deconstructing the image and trying to push it really hard to say, OK, we know conventional very nicely framed, very nicely composed uh, photography. And what if you break this? And how far can you go into the image? How far can you break it? Because if you're trying to break it, you're also trying to test it. So, you know, if you want to know if it's a good photography or not, you have to test it again and again. If you want to test a photograph you made, you have to print it big and small on the screen, on bad paper, on good paper, and if it's a good photography on all, try as you may, then it's a good photography. Well, Moyama, I think, tried it in a book form to test what photography is. And it could be as blurred as possible, it could be as white, you don't even know what it is, abstract, it can be just uh, a strip of negative. You recognize the number up there, 27. What is a photography? That's, uh, to me, when he was saying bye-bye photography, it was a way to, to ask himself, how far can I go into, into a photography? What is a photography? I think the book form is a very... I think for, for everyone that wants to go into uh, the history of photography and try to understand what's happened, why it happened, what's going to be the next step, and so on, I think the book form is the best way. Because in a book form, you have to go all the way down of what is the story, what is the concept of the book, what is the type of uh, reproduction you want to make, the paper, the title, the text, everything had to go into it. So then if you go after a few years, if you go back into it, you can really understand what the photographer is trying to do, try, or tell you. I think this work from 72 is pretty powerful. When you, when you see that as an artist, um, you ask yourself, well, what can I do next after that? In black and white photography. What, what can you do? And that was 40 years ago. I mean, the guy did that 40 years ago. To me, this is mind-blowing. Okay, um, these are things from 40 years, even more than that, 50 years ago. When I, I, I became a, a prof professional photographer 10 years ago, and uh, one of the first, thing, the first things I did before becoming a professional photographer is I went to a workshop in Arles, in France, at the Arts Festival, <coughs> and I spent one day with a photographer called Raymond de Pardon, who's a famous uh, French photographer. And I was showing him this great black and white prints from the Paris subway and the trips in Morocco and beautiful composed images and nice prints and so on. And he looked at it like this and he said, uh, do you do color photography? <laughs> and I was like, well, that's a good idea. Well, and he said, well, you know what? In black and white, everything's been done already. So it's going to be very tricky for you to to go, you know, to make a living out of your photography. And um, to some extent, I think this is wrong. But to some extent, I think he was right. And um, and I obviously went into black and white photography and I did many projects in, in black and white photography, which I will show you in the second part of the evening. But um, 
it was a way to say, well, if you want to become a photographer, you're going to have to stick your fingers out and do really something new and something very different. And today, um, for me, documentary photography, it's not only about making a nice picture um, of a good story, it's becoming more and more, whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not, it's more and more about the concept, and it's also about uh, um, uh, yeah, the concept of the actual image, not just the concept of the project, but also the concept of the image, how the image is built, and what is the sense of the image. So, um, it's um, a first example I'm going to give you, which is can you read it? Uh, it's, uh, pro pro it's another book from uh, a, a, a photographer, an American photographer called Trevor Paglen, and he's made this book called Invisible. And um, I'm really interested in the title because I lately have been trying to work on a lot of invisible subjects, things that you cannot see and you're trying to grasp with photography. And he's worked on what he called covered operations and classified landscapes. So these are uh, secret uh, uh, base, military bases in, in the US, um, classified operations, things that happen and that you cannot see. The purpose is classified, meaning nobody needs to know, have to, needs to know, or in other words, is supposed to know about it. So what they do is that they they have this um, base in uh, several bases in, in 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 the U.S. and it's surrounded by a, a buffer zone, which is a zone which is nothing else than just themselves, of up to 50 miles. Okay, so 70 kilometers. And Trevor Plaget, he's made pictures of these places, which are secret classified, with a lens. Uh, techniques that astronomers used to, are using to make pictures of planets and of stars. So this picture he made, uh, for example, at a distance of, let's say, 30 miles. So the guy is, is, is outside of the buffer zone, he's trying to take a photograph of an invisible subject, which is this invisible operations that nobody needs to know, nobody wants to know, or everybody wants to know about it, nobody is allowed to know about it. And these are the type of images that he, he can do. So some are very clear, or too clear. It's blurred, but you can see a car, you can see a plane, it's pretty obvious. Some are kind of uh, more difficult to understand. This is like a building, obviously. Some are just like a line of lights like the one on the cover of the book. This is getting into the second part of this project, which is um, uh, photographing drones. How do you photograph a drone? Well, this is how it's photographing a drone. A drone you can't see, right? But it's up there, and he knows the position of the drone. He knows the the, 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 where the drone is passing by, and he's making a picture of the sky, and you can't see the drone. So there are more images that I'm, I don't have here of this project, but some are really abstract images that you cannot really recognize. It's just colors. It's just very blurry, and you and you don't understand what you're looking at. And in and, and, and the same way that Moriyama has been saying bye-bye photography at the time, 72. We're in sitting in 2010 or so. And Paglen is saying, yeah, this is pictures of classified operations in the US. Whether you can see something or not, this is what it is. This is the actual <coughs> operations that the Americans are, are, are have over there. So, there is not only just a document that is that is the picture, even though you cannot really see from the picture what, what's happening there. What comes with a document is also the imagination, is what you would put into this image, what you think is happening there. 
nobody knows what's happening, right? It's classified. So you can put whatever you, you, you think, um, what your imagination gives you, to understand what's happening there. The same goes with the, with the skies, which are obviously very beautiful images, and he, call it, and he calls it drawing, right? So it's, it's pretty disturbing and also mind-blowing for me that the guy is going so far out into making a picture of the sky and, and telling us it's a picture of a drone. I'm going to give you a second example of, of, of another. These are, are, are basically um, projects that when I saw them, I was like, wow, what is it? How come? I mean, how can it work like that? I used to do like photography on the ground, you know, person, landscape, whatever. And, and these, are, these photographers are coming with concepts of images, like Maya Man 72. Like, it's really, I think, disturbing, and, and you have to ask, ask yourself the question is, why, what is he trying to say? So another um, example is, is this book that became one of the most successful, successful books um, in the last few years called, of a photographer called Christian Petersen. And um, this is a book uh, called Red-Headed Peckerwood. And it's about the story of a couple of uh, killers back in the 60s that um, have killed uh, 10 people over three days, of which uh, uh, three, I think, are uh, the family of the girl. So uh, the father, the mother, and probably the brother of the girl was killed by it. Uh, her boyfriend, and then they fled together, the boyfriend and the girlfriend, across the US, killed people, and then eventually got arrested and got to jail, etc. etc. So, and Christian Patterson, like 40 or 50 years after, he made a book which is it's a concept again of images that are a mix of archival images, so this would be an old picture from the time when they were, um, uh, the police was investigating about the case, trying to find evidence. This could be the house where one of the killings happened. And also, like a, a police uh, picture, you can see the cropping uh, red signs on the picture because it was probably published in a magazine. So this is the actual girl that got arrested, so one of the two killers. And you can see the front of the image, and you can see also the back of the image, which are basically probably the caption, and also some notes. And he's showing both in the book, okay? He's showing the archive, the actual front, and the actual back. This would be the map, or some map, that he has found and scanned of a place where uh, eventually there's a house, a few houses, there's a road, and then there's a point of catch, which is probably where uh, the two killers were arrested back then. Then he's making his own pictures of the places. This is about emotions. Like you, you get to know a lot about the case, um, the criminal case. You read a lot about it, and then you travel in the places, and you're trying to make pictures of how you of how you would feel if you were there at the time, or how do you feel knowing that this has happened, these killings. Um, I got to meet uh, Christian in, in, uh, in a talk, like a similar talk, and he was explaining, it was really, really interesting because he was, he was explaining that before making a single image of this, of this work, he, made a, he read a lot about it, and then he made a list of words. Uh, so, it's like a to-do list, words, and then he had to illustrate every word with an image. So, for example, uh, fruitcake, fruitcake 98 cents, this is not a picture, this is actually a painting that he's done, that takes uh, one of the quotes that he has found in one of the texts from back then, like uh, from the police, for example, that was mentioning fruitcake for 98 cents 
and he captured this word and he's painted it and added it in his book. So it's not only about pictures, it's also about found images, archive images, images from the police department, paintings that he's made, and uh, things. Obviously, this you can imagine what it is, right? It's one of the hammer that may have helped for, for one of the kings. Either this is a, the actual uh, hammer that uh, he got to the police station and he was able to make a picture of it, or another one that he has found and made a picture of it against uh, like a, 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 a neutral background. Um, we don't know which one, we don't know if this is the truth or not, but you understand what this thing is doing here, right? I mean, same here. It looks like blood. Obviously, it's not blood, but, uh, because it's coming 50 years after. He's also added small papers uh, that are facsimile, so the, actual, the exact same reproduction of even pieces of papers that either from the victims or from the police department or from the actual killers. Um, and he's added them in the book. In the back, you can see also some stamps. This would be also a, a picture from the police department where you see the killer from the back. He's got blood on his ears because on his ear because he probably got you know beaten up during the uh, during the arrest. This is a this is a uh, a will uh, a will uh, from. Um, that he, has, that he has painted as well, with this quote that says, you can't run away from anything. This is actually what the girl, on the day of the arrest, when the, the, when the journalist came to her and asked her to say something about what's happened, she said, you can't run away from anything. This is the actual killer that said that 50 years ago, meaning you cannot kill 10 people and run away from it. At some point, you get arrested. And the, the photographer, Say the artist photographer felt it was so important that he had to write the same somewhere, the quote somewhere, and he decided to put it on a on a car wheel because obviously he was probably trying to flee a bit, trying to run away. He's, he's writing this quote on the actual wheel of the car that's helped them to fly away from the case. And the book is like this: it's across 150 pages, um, things that are kind of evidences. Uh, documents, uh, quotes, papers, like if you were a police uh, officer investigating into the case. It doesn't have any captions, it doesn't have any explanations, and it's unless you meet the guy, the actual photographer, unless you meet with him, and unless he explains you what every single picture means, you basically have no clue. Like if you were a police officer and you were trying to things and trying to understand what happened. And I think the same goes with the previous project, which is about bringing up your imagination. I think new documentary photography is about that. It's not only about documentary, documenting something, showing it. It's also about bringing another level, another meaning to the image and to the work. So just to give you another example, this little blue dog, uh, puppy dog, whatever, uh, like toy, um, Christian has gone into the houses where the killings happened. He's gone to the police station, he's met with the police officers, he's gone to the archive, he's actually found the bullets, he's found the documents, he's, he's been working as a police officer 50 years after. And in, a, in some of the, the, the readings, the killer was talking about this, like a, a toy blue dog, that he was carrying around with him because the kid, I mean, the killers were like 16 and 17 year old, they were really young. And, um, and for some reason, the dog has never been found. Like the killers have been traveling, killing people, taking the car, moving from places to places with this dog, and nobody could find it. And the photographer, going into these houses, one after the other, 50 years after, actually found a blue toy dog in the house where the killing happened 50 years before. Which to me is just like, again, mind-blowing. Because he's, getting, he's playing 
he put his life through. So he's going after the fact, 50 years after, trying to understand what's happened to make this good. And he actually finds one of the evidence that we're missing, he finds it himself. And then he makes a picture of it against uh, a background, which is pink, because the dog is blue, boy, in pink background, is a girl, the killer is a, is a man, and together with a woman. So this is the concept I was telling you about. And for me, this is documentary photography. It's not, photo it's not photo journalism, obviously, but it's documentary photography. Um, another project, which I think one is one of the most important in the past 10 years, um, is Doug Ricard, a new American picture. Um, you know about the Americans by Robert Frank. You know how often um, America has been uh, photographed by great masters like Dorothy Alon, like Walker Evans, like Robert Frank. And every time it was, this is America. This is America in poverty, this is America in like middle class, this is America white against blacks, etc. Et and Doug Ricard, and he made this title on purpose. He wanted to be part of the history of photographers that photograph America. So he called it a new American picture, which is good because I'm talking about new documentary photography. So he's helping me on this. And what's very interesting about Doug Ricard is that he's not a photographer. He made a photo book, which is to me one of the most important photo books in the past 10 years, and he hasn't made a single image, not even one. The guy's been sitting on his computer and has been downloaded images from Google Street View. As simple as that. Now, why this project has become more interesting than any other Google Street View project? Well, because he wanted to be part of this history of American photographers photographing <coughs> America, like a, a tradition that repeats itself. And he's, he's chosen Google Street Views from uh, the suburbs of the middle-sized uh, or large-sized uh, town and cities in the U.S. and where obviously there's lots of poverty, where it's all about uh, uh, being black, Hispano, poor. It's more, it's, it's a lot about forgotten um, um, urban places, empty. And like probably the Bronx and places like that where not so many photographers go anymore. And by selecting only these images and being very good at editing this work, like if you was the photographer, you, rec you can recognize that, sorry, you can recognize that he's always got the same kind of subjects, same places. He's able to become <coughs> one of the important photographers that, I've, that has photographed. America or the US. And you could recognize the height also from the Google Street uh, car. It's it's on the, the car drives around and has a mast on top of the, the roof. So it's higher than everybody in the street. That's why you always have the same angle from the top. This book was uh, in the first place almost like self-published with a very small publisher in Germany like an artist book, and he made uh, 200 copies. It was sold like this, and now the book is, is worth, uh, is, is worth uh, several uh, thousands of euros in the, in the first uh, edition. This is the second edition with Aperture, which is a famous American, famous American uh, uh, publisher. Um, so, um, the this is about more, these three projects are really, for me, again, disturbing. Because suddenly, I'm trying to do my work, I'm trying to become a good, even better photographer, if I'm good, if I'm not good, a good photographer. And then this guy shows up, and he is making one of the most important photo books in history, and he didn't do a single picture. What, what, what's happening to photography? I mean, 
and back into what Moyama was selling in 72, bye bye photography. So, <coughs> these are more question marks, right? I don't have answers for this. I'm just giving you what my, my thoughts are. Now, the, I was telling you earlier that um, distribution has changed a lot. And uh, it's not so much about being published in the press. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but in Europe, everybody, every photojournalist is, is complaining about the press, the press is, is the prices, they don't pay the photographers anymore. Photographers go in war zones taking risks, they have no guarantee, no nothing. And they, they don't even show you sell a single picture when they're back. So there's a real problem. I mean, photojournalists are not able to be published. So they're starting to do exhibitions. They're starting to get conceptual photography. Uh, they're starting to do books. I mean, they will always have been doing books, but now more and more. And another thing that we've noticed is uh, more and more use uh, the internet. Obviously, you have Facebook. But uh, Instagram, I think, is one of the key uh, applications. Uh, obviously, you can promote your work with Instagram. Like if I go on a trip, a story about um, Georgian, I mean, uh, refugees from Abkhazia in, in, uh, in Georgia, like I did, I could make my pictures with my 6x7 camera, analog camera, and then at the same time make iPhone pictures and saying, Posting it on Instagram and saying this is where I am and look, I'm day one of this uh, story in Georgia and this is day two of my story in Georgia, so people can follow me and they know that the story is going to be coming up and it's kind of a way to promote your own work, but without showing the real images, the images are going to come after because you do another pictures, so you use your mobile phone just to promote your whatever you're on the field basically on the ground, but you can. Even do documentary photography just for Instagram. Now, this is not really the case of this photographer called Matthias de Palma. Because, because he's doing this work, uh, he's done for uh, an assignment. Um, I think it was for, I think it's for Elle magazine in France. But I, was, I kept on getting his images on my feed on Facebook, and I was looking at this. Kurdish woman fighters uh, from PKK, and he was posting the images on the on Instagram and on Facebook. And to me, this looks like a real picture. So I don't know if he made an Instagram story, an only Instagram story. So his only camera was the iPhone, for example, or some other smartphone, or whether he was making a story with a six by six camera and then making a second image. Or maybe he was using a 5D for some can, camera, digital camera, and then back at the hotel at night, cropping it, and then sending it to, to, to Instagram. But there have been a lot of uh, assignments, even for war photographers, to publish images only on Instagram. No magazines, no exhibitions, just Instagram stories. Now, Matthias is a good war photographer, a good documentary photographer. He's got 1,500 followers, which is, you could say, a lot, but not a lot at the same time. Um, this is again AKK uh, finders. Um, if we push, the, if we push the, the concept of putting pictures on Instagram further, there is this project which is called Humans of New York. Uh, and as you can see, it's not 1,500 followers. It's 1.9 million followers. And this guy, whoever he is, he's doing a very simple thing. He's doing portraits in the streets of New York. And he's putting the caption underneath, which is basically the conversation he has with the person he's photographing. He or she, but I don't know. Or if the guy or the woman says something, he just writes what the person says. Talking about his life, her life, whatever. Very simple, very basic. One portrait a day in the streets. 
simple portraits, as you can see, nicely framed, but simple caption. And the guy gets 1.9 million followers. Right? I don't know how many exhibitions you would be doing in your life. I don't know how many books you would be selling in your life. <laughs> but before you, you have 1.9 million people looking at your pictures in an exhibition or in a book, there's a lot of work. So now I'm thinking, well, I got this guy. He's doing picture. He's doing a project on the US. He's sitting in his computer. He doesn't do a single picture, and he's doing one of the most important books in history. And I have this guy. He's with his iPhone in, in New York making portraits. He's got a concept clearly, and he's got 1.9 people, 1.9 million people following him. What am I getting wrong here? Right? Why do I have to change? What's happening? And so now I'm thinking, well, maybe uh, maybe I should start to do a story on Instagram and, and see what happens. Maybe I should. Anyway, I think these are questions that you should ask yourself as well. Uh, he's a counselor, so he's always putting everyone else's problem before his own, including mine. So that's probably the girl talking about his husband, saying he's a counselor. And he doesn't really care about the person's life, he cares about um, his client life. This is another one. I've written so many stories and novelas that nobody will look at. Plays that I, that I can't get probably produced, screenplays that will never be made. Everything is so branded these days in the art world, it's so hard for an outsider to get work. Well, if you talk about our own uh, situation as well. So, he's posting images every day, different people. We're all victims of the architect. Architecture is the only art that you can't help but feel. You can avoid paintings, you can avoid music, and you can even avoid history, but good luck getting away from architecture. <coughs> now, the funny thing about this this uh, this project is that this is obviously contemporary and it's very uh, digital and Instagram and blah blah blah. But he probably got he probably got the idea of this work with the work of uh, some other guy called Jim Goldberg, who's a photographer with Magnum, who did this work like. 30 years ago, 30 or 40 years ago, <coughs> same thing, picture and people talking about their situation. <coughs> so on top, you have the woman telling about his, her husband, and in the back, you have the husband talking about the wife. <coughs> Says, we have a great lifestyle, we love private airplanes, fancy yachts, cars, vacations, people like to be with us. We are an exciting couple. We have power because I'm a good person. You get power because uh, want to give uh, to anyway. So same per same idea basically. So and this guy obviously is definitely not part of the same uh, class. Saying I'm I'm going to build an empire, and he's obviously probably some poor guy from Hong Kong. He was on the way. So, this is, I think, interesting because after telling you about this and the way documentary photography is evolving, I'm looking at this and I can't help myself thinking about this work from 30 years ago. So it's like a cycle coming back. And I think we want to uh, keep testing, we want to experiment, we want to do new things, we want to reinvent ourselves because I think the, the because I think the, uh, the industry is in crisis. But the good thing is to keep our our um, uh, first inspirations with us. We build something new, but on something you know, something real. And these images that I showed you before. Yes, I'm not look, no, I'm not looking into Arikatira's books anymore. No, I'm not looking into Kodika's books anymore, because I know 
the images by art and it's not an inspiration for future work. But every time I'm in doubt, every time I'm thinking, oh shit, what should I do next? Should I do Instagram? Should I do digital? Should I do analog? Should I do color? Should I do black and white? Uh, should I do an exhibition? Should I do a book? Should I do a book with a publisher? Should I do a self-published book? Should I do Facebook stuff? Well, I'm always stepping back a bit and I'm always thinking, why have you become a photographer in the first place? What is truly the base on which you built your life as a photographer? And then I, I know I can rule out Google stuff, I know I can rule out uh, like a lot of things. Making a book for me is to make a book with a publisher rather than self published. So you can rule out a number of things and keep going forward with this new. Uh, revolution to me, new evolution of documentary photography, but always keeping in you what, why you become a photographer in the first place. And this guy has got 1.9 1 million, 1 million people following him, or her, but he's been looking in this direction 30 years back to do this project. And I think this is a really good uh, example of what needs to be done. And this sentence is a good way to finish this uh, first part of this class. I'm going to build an empire. Right? Because there's as many people in the second part than the first part. So, in the first part, we're really, really to stay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, in the second part, I'm going to talk about my own work. Um, and it's, it'd be good because it will show, it will, it will, you will see. Um, it's like two things, right? It's the picture you make and the picture you look at. And over 10 or 15 or 20 years, you, see, you keep juggling between your own images and the images that the other people do. Basically. We've looked at the images that uh, other people have done, and now we're going to look at my images, and, and sometimes you can see the, the match, basically. Because obviously I'm very inspired by other people's work. Other people's works. Um, this is the first project I did uh, when I became a professional photographer 10 years ago. Uh, it's a project on the, the new borders of Europe, um, or the um, European community, I should say. So I took a car and I drove around uh, the new borders of Europe, across the, uh, uh, the Baltic Sea coastline, and across the, uh, along the, the borders of uh, uh, Russia, Belarus down to Adriatic Sea and then back into Italy. So it's like all the new borders. And at the time I was an um, assistant uh, to Stanley Green. I don't know if you know Stanley. Uh, the photojournalist. He is our uncle somehow. Okay, yeah. he's the uncle of many, many uh, good yeah. people. So I'm happy to be part of the same family. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, he, um, and, and so I did, that was my first project after I gave up my job, I gave up my flat, we broke up with my girlfriend at the time, it was a really difficult situation. <laughs> yes, it was, it's so funny. And then um, I said, okay, enough with all this, this finance bullshit and so on, I want to do photography, so up, I'm going to go take a car and do my first project about New York. And I thought I was a very good documentary photographer. I wanted to become a good photojournalist, a good photographer, documentary photographer. And when I went back, I showed my contact sheets to uh, Stanley, and he uh, looked at it. And he said, well, <laughs> your documentary project is a real failure. <laughs> that was the first thing. I was really happy about that. And um, um, because he said that you, you didn't get too close to the people and obviously if you talk to the people, uh, I would have had needed an, a translator, a fixer, I would have had to take, you know, uh, not just take the car and go, basically, uh, but things, you know, read before and prepare a bit more and, and also have someone to help you translate and ask questions and basically get into really on the ground. And, and, and uh, did, that's that part I didn't do. And, all the pictures of people, and it was from far, it wasn't really interesting. So he said it's, it's a failure, but you have some very, very good, very nice, beautiful, poetic images. And uh, 
what I was telling you that uh, at some point I have to decide whether I'll be a, a documentary photojournalist or a documentary artist. From day one, because of Stanley, the choice was already made. So, okay, he could be a sort of documentary photographer, <laughs> artist, not photojournalist. Even though after that I did more of a photojournalism kind of projects, but still. From, that, from day one, so um, these are the images from that from this project. And Stanley was able to identify these images in my contact sheets, a humongous amount of images that have no interest whatsoever. And I mean, it was a big stack of many, many different things. And among those, there were at least yeah 20, let's say. After three months' work, it was a 20 picture like color, color, sort of were making sense, and these are the ones. And I, um, and I, uh, this is an Italian, and I, uh, I got a grant for this for this work uh, in back in France called La Bourse du Talent, which is photography.com, who's sponsoring this thing, and um, and, it was, and 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 I decided because I got this grant to continue this work. Um, about the ex-Soviet Union and about the legacy of the Soviet Union and also uh, it talks about the absence and also some kind of a souvenir, nostalgia, many things that are related to this area, which you know well, uh, but, I do, but still. Um, and, um, but also was a, in a way a reflection of my own states. So it's funny because you you're in a personal state, you have you know things happening inside of you, and you want to do something which is supposed to be true documentary photojournalism, and you come back with images that are supposed to talk about that region, places you've been to, and in fact they talk about yourself. So I thought it was actually a good failure. And if that was a failure for me, because, okay, it wasn't really what I wanted to do in the first place, but I found many things that I wouldn't expect in my own work. That was because I was a, a true beginner. And not a true beginner, but a true beginner as a professional photographer. <coughs> so, um, this was black and white. Uh, I started to develop my films and also print my work in black and white because it was too expensive to, to do it with a lab. So uh, but then I got a lot into printing because because it was the way to finish the work. Um, you make the picture and you have to develop the film a certain way and then you have to print a certain way. And only on the print you have the the, uh, the end products, so called. So I ended up uh, continuing this work, I keep traveling in the eastern part of Europe, and um, I did a few exhibitions in France and around, and showing my prints, uh, selling a few, but uh, not so much, not so many. And um, one of the trips I did was in uh, South Caucasus and eastern Turkey. I did a tra I did traveling. That was uh, 2006, so it was like three years after. So I'm not going to be too much into the details of all these projects, but I just want to show you some, basically, a few examples of what I did and how it flows into what I said previously. Um, uh, this was a trip I made with Stanley in 2006. It was a trip to Baku in Azerbaijan. My idea was just to do continue this work about the legacy of the Soviet Union in the ex-Soviet uh, states, uh, satellites of uh, Europe, satellites of Russia. Um, and um, I ended up in, uh, in Azerbaijan uh, with Stanley, and he was working on his project about, uh, about, uh, about the region, basically, around Chechnya, and um, the legacy of the Karabakh War. Uh, and, um, <coughs> I ended up uh, really bumping into a story which I never had planned to do and I never wanted to do, 
which is the story about uh, refugees or uh, displaced people from um, obviously Karabakh in Azerbaijan and then also then I went to Georgia it was refugees displaced people from South Ossetia and Kazan and also in Turkey was displaced people from uh, the war between the uh, Turkish army and the PKK rebels and this became a project called Bezuki uh, Pipeline, which was a forgotten by the pipeline, which is basically along the pipeline BTC, Baku Tbilisi Jihad, which goes from Caspian Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. For, and I know you know, I'm sure you know about this pipeline, right? Yeah. We're sitting on it, pretty much. It's flows on I did this work with Nestan uh, as well at the time. Uh, so, I, I wasn't planning at all to do a story about the pipeline, about refugees and displaced people and blah, blah, blah. I ended up being in this place. It was, it was part of the legacy from the Soviet Union. It was part of this whole thing about the nostalgia. So I went into this place. We went together with Stanley. And uh, this story struck me so hard that I thought, well, you're a photographer. You're here. What are you going to do? You're going to just uh, pretend you're doing your own work? You know, interested in this people's situation and, um, and the fact that the refugees and the displaced people are still in the same tent, um, Red Cross tents, 20 years after the end of the war, or supposed to be the end of the war, or you're just going to talk about this. And uh, I decided to deviate from my original project and to work on this thing, which was my most photojournalist project ever. Uh, like. Uh, it's not war, but it's post-war situation. And it was people that have been shot, people that have been shot at, but still alive. People of the house being shot at, so they have to put uh, stuff to protect from bullets from the other side. So it was, you know, refugees living in train cars. This is train cars. This is in Azerbaijan. Uh, this is in Georgia, actually, where displaced people living in run down buildings. Um, these are refugees from uh, Chechen and Pakisi. So this became more and more difficult to do this story because when last time was here and she can which she can testify and she, the more we were getting into this, the more we found that the situations of these people were really disturbing and really, really terrible. So uh, you cannot turn me back. You have to keep going, doing it. You have to keep talking. You know, doing the work best, best way you want to do, even if you deviate totally from the project. And, um, and that's why this project becomes uh, the story about being forgotten. Because every time we were walking into a place, a flat, a train car, a rundown building, a abandoned hotel. We had stories of people that basically were forgotten. Forgotten by the state, forgotten by their home country because they, have to flee, they can't come back. Forgotten by the uh, NGOs because they don't have funding for that. Because when, you do, when you're an NGO, you're trying to fund a project in Azerbaijan or Georgia where you have money. People don't want to fund your project. Because they say, well, you know what? Azerbaijan, they have, they have gas. They can finance their own project. I mean, they can finance their own uh, humanitarian projects. We don't want to do that So, forgotten by everyone. And um, this is in Turkey, in um, uh, uh, villages that are destroyed by the Turkish army during the war against the PKK. This is one of these uh, villages. And I did this work in three, in three trips. First was Azerbaijan, second Georgia, third was Turkey. After the first trip in Azerbaijan, I thought, wow, well, I'm going to continue this, this story, but this is not the type of pictures I want to do. And, but that's okay, because what I saw in Azerbaijan was the worst. It cannot be worse than that. Then I went to Georgia, then I visited these people living in tents or 12th floor of these abandoned hotels, old people that cannot walk anymore, so they cannot go down the stairs anymore, so they left up there. And if somebody doesn't bring food to them, they basically stay there, right? And I thought, well, shit, I mean, 
situation in Georgia and these people is, is even worse than I, than I thought, even worse than in Azerbaijan. Then last trip was in Turkey, and I thought, okay, I'm going to go to eastern Turkey, where the pipeline, basically the pipeline avoids that region. And I thought, why is the pipeline avoiding all the eastern Turkey? I need to go and see what happens there. And this is where you have hundreds of villages that are totally destroyed, and peasants that are, after fleeing into the cities, have to go back into the villages to try to rework the land and try to get um, um, kettles again and try to grow the land again because they cannot live in the cities, basically. And I thought, well, this is a total disaster. I mean, along this pipeline, which is huge, it's one million barrels a day at the max. Uh, the situation is just is just terrible. I mean, it, it can be from day, from first mile to last mile of the pipeline above the surface. It's just it's just total. You know, I don't know. I was I was really just shocked by this. So I did the, I did the work because I I couldn't turn my back. But I, I felt it wasn't my job to do to do. I mean, it wasn't the type of talk I wanted to do. But still I, I still, I made it the best way I could. And when I went back, nobody was waiting for these images. I had no agency, I had no gallery, no publisher. I was just sitting on all these images. And, and I have interviews, thanks to Nesta in Georgia, and thanks to uh, Rena in Azerbaijan, who was translating for us. Um, I have amounts of amazing amounts of text, people testifying about the situation, what's happened to them, and so on. And I was like sitting on it, literally, uh, thinking, what, what am I going to do with this? Why have, why have, have I done this? Why am I, what am I going to do with this? And it was a really painful process to go through, because I felt like the story had to be told, but I had no way to tell the story. Right? No agency, no gathering, no nothing. Eventually, I, I got to show this work to uh, uh, one gallery, Social Photography in Paris. They paid for an exhibition. It's quite well known for, uh, gallery. And we got the book also. We got funded by Amnesty International, by the French government. Uh, and suddenly, come, suddenly the story is coming out, and I felt better about it because at least people got to know about it. And uh, but. Um, the thing, uh, this was a turning point for me as well because I was telling you about at some point you have to make a decision whether you want to become an artist or whether you want to become a photojournalist. After this, this work I thought, oh, okay, successful, I have exhibitions, I got a, I also got screened at uh, Visa pour l'image in Perpignan, which is a <coughs> festival of photojournalism. And I got a um, traveling exhibition with Pope and so on. Okay, it works out quite well. And uh, I thought maybe I should do that. But at some point I felt like I was uh, staging my own photography. Like I wanted to, I, I didn't know if I was showing how good I was as a photographer or if I really wanted to tell the story of these people. And to me it was a real problem. I thought either you're an artist and you want to show <laughs> your work and how good you are, or you want to tell these people's story. You can't do both. It's very difficult. At least for me, it was impossible to do both. So, um, yeah, so I, I basically moved on from that uh, type of work. And um, getting, getting into the next uh, <coughs> series of images I want to show you is still this project basically of, of uh, satellites of, of Russia. This is more recent, this is 2008, 2009, 2012, 2013. This is work about the Aral Sea in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, and about the disappearance of the sea, another legacy of uh, Another story, a story about uh, absence and uh, disappearance and uh, emptiness and so on. So, it keeps coming back. It's some of these topics that keep coming back to me, and probably I'm still talking about myself when I, when I drew these pictures. But it's mm -hmm. this is this project is the end of my 10 year project about extra meaning. So, we're done with this. <laughs> it's good for you, it's good for me as well. <laughs> we're done with it. It's an extra meaning. 
Um, and and uh, but it's funny because when I went to to visit the fishermen on the Arles Sea, so the Arles Sea disappears. It's dry land now, and there's a there's a bridge that's been uh, there's a dam that's been built so that the water is kept so that the fishermen can still fish there. And then this part is then kind of disappear. There's no fish. Blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to tell you about this, but I went there to do still continue to this work, long term project about uh, about Soviet Union, and, and I thought, okay, I'm going to make picture of the fishermen about uh, desert, desert, about uh, about uh, a dry landscape and misery somehow, and uh, boats like wrecks on the sand. And, I had all the images in my head before going there, and that's terrible because that's that means you have to you have to either run away or just forget about it and do something different. I always felt like I had to do something, try to make something different, basically. And one day, um, it was uh, in this village called Moinac, where the, 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 the fisherman's village and the sea goes is gone 200 kilometers away from the, from the village. You can still see the coastline, right? So you still see the houses, and then there's a bit of a drop in the, in the landscape, and then this flat end, totally flat end. And at night, with the sun falling down, I was like, you know, enjoying the, uh, the fresh air and the beautiful light and so on. And it's, I'm looking at a dry land, but because of the coastline and the houses and the little. Uh, it was like, like little whatever sand on the, on the dry land. It's almost like I saw the sea. And it's like my, my imagination, still of imagination we talked about, like played, played a trick on me. That dry land is one of those, the, the coastline is, is sea. So what you're looking at is the sea. And in fact, it wasn't, it was sand. So I got totally, um, it really just disturbed disturbed me again, I felt, okay, you were here to make a story about fishermen and misery and so on, and typical situation and wrecks on the sand. You didn't want to do that at the same time. And, and suddenly you have something happening about the illusion, like the illusion of the sea, that like in a glimpse of a second, it was an illusion you saw, you saw but it's unreal. And I thought maybe I should, I should work on this idea of the sea being an illusion. It's an illusion for the fisherman there because it's, it's supposed to be here but it's gone. After the dam was built, the, the sea came back but not all the way to them. So they go with a, with a motorcycle or with a car to get to the sea. Some are very close, some are very far. Some don't go anymore because there's some room of fishes. At, in, in winter, uh, it freezes. So you actually drive on the actual sea. And in Uzbekistan, you drive on a seabed. So it's all about this illusion of water, which is supposed to be here, but not here. Was there, not here anymore. Is here, but underneath, because it's frozen. And I uh, wanted to talk about this region, and also I wanted to make a nice exhibition of this work. And I made prints. This is all analog work. I make prints myself, and I make prints with a printer that's colored, by the way, uh, who was able to take my idea all the way, which is to, in a way, erase the sea on the images. So this is uh, the frozen sea, right? It's uh, ice and the blue skies, the blue sky. And uh, on the printing, we we switched, we switched on the lights while we were printing, so it's a big print, it's 80 by 100 centimeters. We switch on the lights, so, so the paper becomes gray, and then we print the image on top of it, so that there's no white anymore, and the, and the picture is half um, erased, basically. It doesn't print properly, it's, always, it's almost half erased. So it erases the contrast, and, and the ice, or the water, is part of the sea, the, sea uh, the, the, the sky, the sky is part of the, the sea, and, it, and you cannot really see where the limit is. Same goes, oops, same goes with this fisherman, who's, step, who's standing on the sea, but you cannot see if it's really sea or 
uh, ice or uh, salt? Many people told me, oh, but what is it? Is it salt? Is it? Well, good question. It's, it is ice, but sometimes it's not ice. And same, the, the sky disappears. Um, it would be easier to, to show you these pictures with a real prince because it's, it's really analog work. Um, this is a, a, a kind of a print I made as well, where black and white prints were, again, the sea is red. I'm printing only the center of the image with a little bit of water, but not, not so much. Because again, I'm playing with this illusion of water, which is here, but could be uh, not here if you were a few kilometers away, gone for some people, still here for others. This is uh, back into the ice. Uh, my film, because of the cold, uh, got stuck, and my camera got stuck. And uh, part of the image is, is actually hidden by this, this black, black strip. Here is the same. And, and I use that as an idea as well to erase part of the picture. This is kind of putting some, some concept on top of the documentary photography. But this is what I was telling you about. I'm happy to talk to people about the situation of the fisherman and the situation of the sea. Um, I got many interviews, I got documented, and, but I want to bring something else. I want also to bring a concept into the work, especially from an exhibition where people are supposed to buy the prints, and people are supposed to get interested in the actual prints, not just the story. So the concept that comes on top of the story is how you print the story. This is another one of a big prints that I did. A handmade print. This is sand covered with ice and snow. I will see a, a hole in the, in the ice with the fisherman. This is another portrait of one of the fishermen holding... Uh, how do you say it in English? Is that Lamps. Lamps. Thank you. Um, we just heard one. Yeah. Um, so again, I want to. I want him to be tall and white. These are a group of uh, fishermen that are on the on the sand. They're just back from fishing, and they go with a bicycle because the sea is gone. And so we were pausing after this, the the fishing session, and again I printed it without. The, without the sea, even though you can see it in between the two of This portrait as well, yeah. there's no sea behind him. Okay. This, is, this is also when I switch on the light while printing, <coughs> so it could be viewed as a mistake or as a something you probably got while printing, but to me it's more this idea of the, the, the sea uh, erasing itself. And also you get some of the liquid, the chemicals on the side, which brings back to the idea of the liquid and the sea. Um, this is probably a raised image that I exhibited as well, where you, the sea and the, and the water is completely erased. Just by switching on the light, it erases the image. This is an accident. I forgot to tell you this. The idea of erasing things like this, like the white, this, this, and this was an accident in the lab. I sent to the printing and here you do the strips to know if you get good time or, or less or more time to make a proper print. And I, on this image, I had a very little uh, amount of time and I could see faces showing up from the white. Uh, so it wasn't enough to make a proper print, but I felt this image, this face that's coming out of the white was a beautiful idea because of the erase, erasing of the sea, these people also get erased because they, they're not fishermen anymore. Some are, but most of them can't be going to fishing anymore. And I, and I use this as a, this accident as an idea to make the print. This was another accident which I used as a, as a proper print. And it was, it's, it was coming back to this thing of my erasing bye-bye photography. In the end, I'm, I don't care, I don't want to show the guy fishing. Uh, I just want to bring my idea about what what it is to bring a, a photograph from there with this concept, with this story around the town. And I don't really care. The, the picture could be totally erased. 
right? It could work. You could say, yeah, there's a picture of a fisherman, but this was so strong that it got totally erased, and you can't see the fisherman anymore. But you know what? This is what's happening to them. They're disappearing for good. The sea is disappearing for good. So why not putting the same thing into the, into the picture? This is the water also. And also this is one of the classic images in the, in the exhibition where you can see a strip of water. It's almost at night. Now, illusion of water. This is one illusion of water. This is the second one. It's actually a view from the train. It's dry night. A third one. This is the seabed in Uzbekistan, driving for hours on the seabed to get to the other side. And, uh, and you have uh, shells, seashells on the bottom in the sand. And obviously I had to have, had to have one picture of, of a dragged ship because I couldn't uh, resist. And this was the only one. But my idea was to do a story about our sea and fishermen in the our sea without a single fishing net, without a single ship of fish, and without a single uh, wreck fi uh, ship. That was a nice challenge. Well, and there's one fish and there's one uh, ship, a shipwreck. So, um, this, is, uh, this is it for that part. I don't know how much time we have. Though. We have enough time. Yeah, everybody's still awake? I'm <laughs> very awake now. Um, I wanted to show also two other projects my family, uh, that have nothing to do with XRD, uh, which are uh, sort of, uh, you could say, assignments. These are pictures from Paris, for change. Uh, I, uh, I had friends working for fashion designer John Gagnon, and they were telling me, oh, you're such a, uh, yeah, you do black and white photography, you should come to the fashion shows and you should make pictures. I was coming back from my trips, like you saw, you know, it could be uh, whatever, I don't see you or Georgia, whatever. And I was showing up, and I was like, what the hell am I going to look I mean, it's just fashion. I'm not interested in fashion. <laughs> and I did that for like uh, six years. Uh, going back to the shows, making pictures of girls being dressed up and being making up, makeup, hair dress, and I was like, what am I doing here? What, what is, what am I doing here? But, the story of John Galliano was, I thought, was really interesting. It's a personal story, and also the, the ideas he was putting into his fashion, which is uh, get inspired by the streets, get inspired by um, poor people, by rich people, by old people, by midgets, by whatever fat people. He could put everything that he that our world is about into his fashion. So I, there was one. Uh, fashion show was about um, the Ukrainian bride, for example. So it was Bulgarian songs in the, in the show, and it was all um, inspired, uh, clothes inspired by the uh, by the Eastern Europe. And I was back from my trips, and I could see the fashion show, and it was like, oh, it's amazing! I see the Bulgarian, I hear the Bulgarian song, and I see this Ukrainian bride, and, and it was like if I was back in my trip. <coughs> but still, I, I didn't know what to do with these pictures because it's. I don't know, it was just bad pictures. <laughs> but initially. And, and at the end, back in the last couple of years, he started to do these shows into this very black uh, surroundings. And also, he lost his uh, second in command, who died of, of a heart attack at 42 years old, Stephen Robertson. And he continued for four years alone, and then he got totally wild and, and got sacked by. Uh, by uh, from Gujo and Galliano, and he, he became a colleague, a dog addict, and so on. So he really went down the two men. And uh, the way I felt in the fashion show was like very alone and 
what the hell am I doing here and what kind of pictures am I doing and why would people be interested in people, girls being dressed up and in fact he was talking about some loneliness and something that was vanishing which is basically a situation of Gagano uh, India and this is the way I felt as well and all these images and I'm showing you only the ones that are exhibited in Paris that would tell, that would tell a story which is not a story about fashion but a story about this loneliness that uh, a fashion designer can feel and, and the situation of Dr. Anna himself, personally. And, uh, and I was able, able to put my own view on, on fashion. And some fashion magazine came to the exhibition because it was Ghanaian. And they were looking at images. It was black and white. It was very grainy. Like this girl is not even dressed up. She's got a skirt for every day and she's just trying to uh, the, the catwalk for the night before the show, so it's not even a proper show. Um, they look sad and a bit bored. And this picture uh, is quite amazing because this is uh, John Gaian in the background, in the, in the background, in the light. He's pretty unknown, which is, which to me was really sad situations before he was uh, sacked. And. Um, I did this picture in 2010, and it was one of the shows, and he was showing up at the end, everybody closing, and it disappears. And uh, after that, he was gone from Dior, John from Galliano, John from Galliano, and it was actually the last time we saw him on, on the catwalk. Last appearance of John, John Galliano on the catwalk, on his shows, and it was the last second where we could see him. And I don't know why I was able to make this picture at the time. But it was a good picture and it became a big print in my exhibition and it was a good story to tell. So it's a lot about uh, ghosts and dreamy and again himself a bit alone, and alone together basically. He's alone but somebody's following him but it's not really you know, close to him. And um, this is another accident in the lab, because all these prints I made myself. And this is a face. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. Uh, it's a face showing up from the white. And I exhibited this white piece of paper in the, in the exhibition. People say, oh, wow, you such a conceptual shit. You just, you just put a white paper. No, you haven't looked at it. Look closer. I said, oh, there's a face. I didn't see it. Oh, okay. About this ghost. This goes to the atmosphere I want to bring in. So again, about the concept, you know, how you could bring concept on top of the uh, uh, on top of the uh, story, and also the, the thing about the accident, uh, about the fact that you're planning to do things, and you know why it works after some years. You don't know why some of the pieces come together. And what you thought were bad pictures become suddenly a good picture, a good story. And this is a, you're one of the first people I show this. Um, that's how you write it after. I'm going back a bit. And the other ones I think you saw properly. And then there's a few more. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, I can uh, scroll down. 
Um, this is a commission work I got from uh, an architect that is uh, refurbishing and reconstructing the top uh, palace, palace in Paris, the Ritz Hotel. <laughs> the most this is the most luxury, <laughs> the most luxury hotel in Paris, called the Ritz, and the, oh, the oldest palace in Paris. And it's uh, three years of refurbishment work, reconstructing it. They've destroyed everything inside the hotel. And I'm, I've been commissioned by the architect to do uh, one series of images every month, every two months. And I'm delivering him the prints so I can do whatever I want. And I warned him. I said, if you tell me this, you're not going to get the proper, you know, nice pictures of a working site. You're going to get strange pictures. And he said, yeah, it's fine. It's what I want. I want a vision. I want something different. And um, and I really I really enjoyed it because it's it's I mean it's like a journey into some strange planet or inside uh, inside the, the the belly of a beast, right? It's all pieces. It's all broken. It's all. Uh, I'm just gonna stop for one minute on this image. The 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 strange light and, and the fact that the the, the fire seems corrupted. Uh, it's on purpose uh, on this image as well, this yellowish. This is not Photoshop. The fact that this is also, it doesn't show good on the screen, it's better on, on the proper print. But what I did is I, I made um, black pictures, meaning I took pictures with about four or five stops below. Uh, under what I should be using. So when I look up on the screen, it's all black. When I'm back at the at my desk, and it's all by the way, this is a digital photography project, the only one so far. Um, I this is another one. I, I I push on Lightroom. I push by four stops to get light again on the image, and then you have this very grainy, strange, uh, broken. Um, Pixel showing up, and it's and it's coming back to this thing about testing what a photograph, a photograph is, bye bye photography thing, is to kind of like it's like a painting that is behind the wall and you want to scratch the wall, see what's behind. Well, this is this is the idea. Not on all not on all the images because I don't want it to be like a gimmick, but um, I'm questioning the texture. And the, and the yellowish color is not natural. It's coming up because the, because it's so much underexposed that when you bring it with a, with a computer, it, it shows up the very strange colors like that. It's like a surprise, and it's like at the same time it's part of the reality. So I like that, and it takes you to some other world, some other yeah, kind of history. This is very bad quality because these are small defects. Um, but this picture is almost like erased as well, and totally scratched. Um, yeah, so this is it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.